Well, good evening, everyone, and thank you for coming and joining us this evening. It is our uh, final Lenten Vespers service, and uh, I just want to invite you next week, uh, this whole coming next week is Holy Week, so we have Palm Sunday, we have Monday, Thursday, we have our egg extravaganza on Saturday, and of course, we have Easter on that following Sunday, and so we have a lot of events next week, and so you're just invited to come to all of them. Uh, you can find more information on our, on our Facebook and our website, and so I encourage you to come join us for those services as well. And now would you uh, please rise and join me in the call to worship. You are my lamp, O Lord. God lightens my darkness. God is my strong refuge and has made my way safe. At the close of the day, Lord, be with us. Fill us with your light.
Amen. You may be seated. What a wonderful hymn that is, uh, one of our Lenten favorites. And I just uh, love the fact that uh, that old rugged cross, um, stained in blood, is going to be exchanged for a glorious crown for each one of us as we walk with Christ through the valley of the shadow of death. And tonight that is our focus, and we will get to that in a few minutes. But before we do, I want us to have a chance to enter into prayer. And so in your, uh, on your programs, you will see that we will have a unison prayer. Uh, following that, I'll give you a few moments of silence, a little longer than we normally do. Uh, but just for you to be able to, to go before God, um, open our hearts up silently to Him, um, and pour out your, your prayers, your joys, your concerns, whatever it may be. And then following that, um, I will close us uh, in prayer. Uh, so let us uh, join together in a unison prayer of the people. Heavenly Father, be with us in every experience of life. When we neglect you, remind us of your presence. When we are frightened, give us courage. When we are tempted, give us power to resist. When we are anxious and worried, give us peace. When we are weary in service, give us energy and zeal. For the sake of our Lord Jesus Christ, amen. And now let us lift our prayers to our God. Lord, we thank you for listening to our hearts this evening. Lord, there is so much that prayer needs to cover um, in our lives and in our world. We know that you are a God that walks with us wherever we are. We praise you that these concerns and joys we've lifted to you tonight, that you have heard them and you are responding to them even now. And we praise you and thank you, Lord. And we ask all of this in your name. Amen. Well, it gives me great pleasure to invite up gracious inspiration to lead us in worship.
bruised and battered, scarred and scorned, sacred head pierced by our thorns. It is finished, was his cry, the perfect lamb was crucified, his sacrifice. Our victory, our Savior chose the mercy tree. Hope went dark that violent day. The whole earth quaked at love's display. Three days Well, our first scripture lesson this evening comes from John chapter 11, verses 38 to 44. It can be found on page 105 of your pew Bible. Then Jesus, again greatly disturbed, came to the tomb. It was a cave, and a stone was lying against it. Jesus said, Take away the stone. Martha, the sister of the dead man, said to him, Lord, already there is a stench because he has been dead four days. Jesus said to her, Did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? So they took away the stone. And Jesus looked upward and said, Father, I thank you for having heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I have said this for the sake of the crowd standing here, so that they may believe that you sent me. When he had said this, he cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. 
the dead man came out, his hands and feet bound with strips of cloth and his face wrapped in a cloth. Jesus said to them, unbind him and let him go. A little longer into Christ's ministry, uh, he met with his disciples during Holy Week on that Thursday night before his crucifixion, and he taught them the truths about heaven and his presence. And just as he raised Lazarus from the dead, now he was sharing with them what their eternal reward would be. So listen as we read from John 14, verses 1 through 7. Uh, It's on page 108 of your pew Bibles uh, for you to follow along. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Believe in God and believe also in me. In my Father's house there are many dwelling places. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself So that where I am, there you may be also, and you know the way to the place where I am going. Thomas said to them, Lord, we don't know where you are going. How can we know the way? And Jesus said, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you know me, you will know my Father also. From now on, you do know him and you have seen him. We praise God for his holy word this evening. Amen. Well, it is time now for our children and our youth to head on back to their uh, times. And as they do, I want to just share with you from our uh, Lenten devotional, A Steadfast Love. This is uh, um, tomorrow's devotional, so sorry if I'm ruining it for all of you. Um, But I thought it was very fitting as we talk about uh, this final week and that God is with us in the valley. Um, We know that the valley of the shadow of death uh, can be the darkest of times. But this is a promise that God is with us, and he's with us because he went there already. Uh, Henry Nouwen says, in his immense loneliness, Christ fell on his face, and he cried out, my father, if it is possible, let this cup pass me by. Jesus couldn't face it. Too much pain to hold, too much suffering to embrace, too much agony to live through. He didn't feel he could drink the cup to the brim with sorrows. Why then could he still say yes? In Matthew 26, where this account takes place um, at the Garden of Gethsemane, where Christ is praying uh, that God would allow this cup of sorrow that he was going to experience to be taken away from him. But he ends that prayer with these words. Yet not what I want, but what you want. For that's the reality, is that God has a plan as the devotional continues. He chose a young virgin to be the mother of his son and our Savior. Thirty-three years later, the climax of God's plans unfolded in another garden called Gethsemane. But the tempter was back telling an anguished Jesus that he could never drink that dreaded cup because it was filled to the brim with the sins and sorrows of all humanity. If he drank, he would become sin, and his father would forsake him. But Jesus knew if he refused the cup, paradise could never be restored. All of humanity would be lost forever. He knew what he needed to do, and he did it. And so we know that Christ walked that valley before, and he walks that valley with each, with each one of us. And so now enjoy our final um, video from Max Lucado's series, You're Never Alone.
The dinner hour had come and gone. John put down the quill and reached for the loaf of bread sitting on the table. He broke off a piece and held it in his hand. The action triggered a memory of days long past of a meal that Jesus and the disciples shared in a home in Bethany. This little village was just two miles east of Jerusalem on the Jericho Road, which made it an ideal place for them to stay when they were in the area. It also didn't hurt that Bethany was the home of a woman named Martha, who was an excellent host and cook. Martha lived there with her sister Mary and her brother Lazarus. They were all good friends of Jesus and often extended an invitation for him and the disciples to dine there. One evening, the disciples arrived to see Martha performing her typical duties, making sure the food was prepared and the guests were all happy and the details were covered. Evidently, she had assumed that her sister would help, but either Mary didn't get the message or she ignored it. And when John walked into the main room, he saw Mary sitting at Jesus' feet, listening to him teach. And John thought it was peculiar, but since it didn't seem to bother Jesus, it didn't bother him. But boy, it certainly bothered Martha. As the evening shadows grew longer, John could tell that her patience with her sister was running shorter. The tension was building in the house and eventually it erupted. Lord, and exasperated, Martha finally declared to Jesus, don't you care that my sister has left me to do the work all by myself? Tell her to help me. And John didn't often hear his master addressed in this manner. And Jesus paused his teaching and replied, Martha, Martha, you are worried and upset about many things. But few things are needed, or indeed only one. And Mary has chosen what is better, and it will not be taken away from her. John put the bread in his mouth and chuckled. These were happy occasions, times shared with friends and family. But as Jesus' ministry drew to a close, those moments grew few and far between. Events were moving forward that would soon lead Jesus to his death on the cross, a penalty that he would pay so we would never again have to be separated from God. Jesus' healing of the blind man set off a debate in Jerusalem and caused him to have to retreat across the Jordan River. It was there he received a message from Martha and Mary that their brother had fallen ill. The message was simple but urgent. Lord, the one you love is sick. It didn't look good for Lazarus, but fortunately he had something going for him, or better stated, he had someone going for him, for Jesus was a close friend. Christ responded with a promise of help. Lazarus' sickness will not end in death, he said. It would have been easy for the messenger to misunderstand the statement and believe that Lazarus would not face death. But Jesus made a different promise. This sickness will not end in death. Lazarus would find himself in the valley of death, but he would not stay there. So the days came and went, and Lazarus began to fade. No Jesus, no help. Finally, Jesus told the disciples the time had come to return to Bethany. And John remembered the scene when they arrived. By this time, Lazarus had been in the tomb for four days. No help from Christ and now no hope. Mary and Martha were disappointed and confused. And it was Martha who reached them first. Lord, she said, if you'd been here, my brother would not have died. Jesus' response was direct. Your brother will rise again, he said. Yes, Martha replied, he will rise when... Everyone else rises at the last day. Jesus looked at her a moment and said, I am the resurrection and the life. Anyone who believes in me will live even after dying. Do you believe this? Can you feel the drama in that moment? Jesus was asking this heartbroken sister, do you believe? He was asking it in the vicinity of the cemetery. He was asking it four days too late because Lazarus was four days dead and buried. Do you believe? <laughs> it's the same question Jesus asks us when we find ourselves in the middle of that valley of death. 
when all hope seems lost and Jesus' help seems missing? But John could barely make out Martha's quiet reply. Yes, Lord, she said. I have always believed that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, the one who has come into the world from God. She mustered a mustard seed confession, but it was enough for Jesus. Soon he was at the stone in front of Lazarus' tomb, commanding it to be rolled away. Martha hesitated, who wouldn't? But Lord, she said, by this time there is a bad odor for he's been there four days. And Jesus insisted, Martha complied. He then issued another command, Lazarus, come out. All was silent for a moment. And then the dead man came out, his hands, feet, and head still wrapped in cloth. Jesus issued a third command, unwrap him and let him go. The resurrection and the life had shouted in order into the very cavern of death, and death had obeyed. Don't miss the message. Jesus meets you at your lowest moments, but he also meets you in the valley of the shadow of death. Yes, you need help to make it through life. You need help to navigate both the deepest valleys and the highest peaks, but more important, you need help at the end of this life. Forgive the unsolicited reminder, but just as Lazarus eventually died a more permanent death, your finish line is drawing near. Every stride and step brings you closer to your final one. Each beat of the heart is the click of a countdown clock. Your days are measured, and no matter how well you run this race, you will not run it forever. And when that time comes, you will need Jesus' help to enter your eternal home. Thankfully, that help has already been given. The invitation has been made, the price has been paid for the raising of Lazarus from the dead was only a small hint of the greater resurrection to come. The religious leaders had been angry at the miracle of the healing of the blind man, but this miracle caused them to fear. If we let him go on like this, they said, everyone will believe in him and then the Romans will come and take away our temple and our nation. Soon plans were in motion to forever end the threat that Jesus represented. For John, time passed like a blur, a Passover meal, a foot washing ceremony, a sleepy journey to a garden at night, a betrayal followed by Roman torches and Roman swords a mock trial, and a sentence of death. All of the disciples fled the scene. Only one among them had received money to betray Christ, but all of them abandoned him in his time of need. John alone returned to the outskirts of the city to stand with Jesus' mother at the foot of the cross. And the hours passed. At noontime, a darkness descended upon the land, and at three o'clock, Jesus cried out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And for the first time, Jesus had been cut off from the fellowship with the Father. God had put the sins of humanity on him and the judgment for those sins. A holy God could not look at the unholiness of sin. And in that moment, Jesus was entirely alone. John watched as a sponge soaked in wine vinegar was lifted to Jesus' lips. When he had received the drink, Jesus said, It is finished. And with that, he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. It is finished. In the Greek language, the phrase is the single word to telestai. It's a holy word, a sacred point in time. The moment the artist steps back from the canvas and lowers his brush, it is finished. This was not a surrender, but a declaration, a victory cry. With this single proclamation, Jesus fed more than a crowd, still more than a storm, and gave sight to more than one man. His command at Bethany had been enough to call Lazarus from the grave. His announcement at Calvary was sufficient to save all who believe in him from eternal death. Jesus' statement indicated a tremendous debt had been erased. Indeed, the Greek word tetelestai carries overtones of a business term. It was used to signify paid in full on debts such as levies or a tribute. 
that a transaction had been finalized, as the author of Hebrews would later state. For by one sacrifice, Christ has perfected forever those who are being sanctified. No further offering is needed. Heaven awaits no additional sacrifice. The work of Christ on the cross satisfied the demands of the eternal tribunal. The greatest of the miracles John records in his gospel, humanity had been redeemed. This fact was emphasized at the moment of Jesus' death when the curtain in the Holy of Holies was torn in two. This veil in the temple had served to separate sinful humans from a holy God, but that separation would be no more. Yet another promise that we are never alone. We typically think of redeemed as a New Testament word, but its roots are in the Israelites' exodus from Egypt. When God struck Egypt with the final plague, it resulted in the death of the firstborn. Throughout the land of Egypt, every firstborn male was killed in a single night, both animals and people. The Jewish people later referred to that moment as Passover because the spirit of death passed over those who had marked the doors of their homes with the blood of a lamb. The firstborn in those households were spared, but a price was paid. Later, God said to Moses, consecrate to me all the firstborn. Whatever opens the womb among the children of Israel, both of man and beast, it is mine. In other words, God had claimed every firstborn within Israel for himself. The firstborn among the animals were sacrificed as an offering of worship. But when it came to people, the Lord said to Moses, All the firstborn of man among your sons you shall redeem. There it is, redemption. The firstborn of each Israelite family legally belonged to God, but God allowed each family to reclaim their child, to redeem him or her by paying a price. It was a legal transaction. Ownership transferred once the debt was paid. Freedom granted for a fee. Jesus did the same for us on the cross. He, he paid the price to set us free because none of us can pay that debt on our own. We need his help. We need his redemption. Paul said it this way, For our sake, God made Christ to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. There is also a legal transaction, the supernatural transfer of our sin to Christ and his righteousness to us. Jesus, God's sinless son, absorbed in himself our sinful state so that we, his rebellious creation, can receive the goodness of Christ. Our part is to simply receive this great miracle of mercy, to let God's grace flow over us like a cleansing cascade, flushing out all dregs of guilt and shame. Nothing can separate us from God. Our conscience may accuse us, but God accepts us. Others may dredge up our past, but God does not. As far as he is concerned, the work is once and for all time finished. John lifted up another piece of bread and recalled the Passover meal that he had shared with Jesus on the night of his arrest. His Lord had picked up the bread as was customary at this point, given thanks for it, broken it, and then said, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Neither he nor the other disciples fully understood the meaning of his words. They didn't comprehend that Jesus, the one who had declared to be the bread of life, was announcing his intent to give up his life so others might live. He was about to show the greatest act of love the world had ever known, to die for his friends. As the sunlight streamed into the room, John knew that because of Jesus' sacrifice on the cross, he would never have to face the valley of the shadow of death alone. Jesus had gone before him and had conquered the grave. In the meantime, he would keep running the race, confident in the knowledge that his friend was waiting for him at the finish line. And when he crossed it, he wouldn't be surprised if he again heard those words from Jesus, it is finished.
through Lent, we have uh, walked this journey with Christ, and we have learned how God is always with us. We have seen the miracles of Christ, and through His miracles, we understand and we know His presence. Now, we know that God is with us in the ordinary. When He turned the wine, the water into wine at the wedding at Cana, we know that God is with us when we're stuck when we see him healing the paralyzed man at the pool. We know that God is with us in the storms of our life when we see him calming the seas and and welcoming his disciples from the boat to the shore of safety. We know that God is with us in the dark when we see him healing the blind man at the pool at Siloam. And finally, we see that God is with us even in death when we see that he asks and commands Lazarus to come out of his tomb, and we hear that Christ is the resurrection and the life. That's the message of Lent. It's a message of Easter. It's a message of our faith, that God is with us, regardless of where we are. He is with us in this life, and he will be with us as we move into the next life a life of eternity, a life of perfection. My prayer is for all of us is that as we walk this life, is that we can feel and understand that Christ is there with us. And that we can live in such a way that it not only guides us, but it it inspires those around us. There's no better powerful message of hope than when people see the, the, the living hope Uh, realized in our lives. And so that's our calling as believers and followers of Christ, is to walk with him and invite and uh, encourage others to join us on that journey. For we know that God is always with us. Amen. Amen. Let us stand now and we'll sing our closing hymn, Uh, Be Thou My Vision, it's hymn number 502, and we uh, welcome Cindy Jays to the front of the church, and we also thank Lorene for um, her music and and leading us tonight, and uh, both Catherine and Lorene are here, and uh, they've led us musically through our Lenten series, and so let's give them both a round of applause. And I think before we start, let's make sure your mic is on. So stand with us as we sing.
Lord God, you are our vision. You are the glory that we follow. Lord God, we praise your name. We lift up our, our love, our grace, and our lives to you. And we pray, Lord, that you will use them to bring about your kingdom here on earth. So all may know of your strength and your power, and all may have your wonderful vision. And so, Lord, it is in your name that we pray. Amen.